You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome back to the Anxiety Podcast. I hope you're doing well. I hope you've had a good week. Last week, two episodes on fire. And uh, this week, hopefully, more of the same. Um, Certainly enjoying being back and enjoying uh, people's feedback. And that's really the the fuel for me is when I get comments from you and stories from you in terms of things that you might have picked up on from specific episodes or changed in a big way, in a small way. I love all that stuff. That's that's the fuel, you know. So if you ever think, oh, he's probably not going to read this. Well, I am. So feel free to send me a direct message on Instagram, The Anxiety Podcast, or Tim JP Collins is my other one. I got two. Um, uh, or you can just send me an email through the website, anxietypodcast.com. Or even better, if you really want to blow my mind, go on to uh, Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to this and leave a review because that uh, I get those, I read those, that makes a massive difference. And as you know by now, that helps the algorithms or whatever it is that you know ranks podcasts and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you know, one of the big reasons for me coming back and doing this again is I think that um, I did need some time in my life to take care of a few things and uh, haven't done that and still kind of a work in progress as we all are. Um, but I've, I think that in terms of giving back to the world, this is one of the, you know, a, a great way that I can do that and actually make a difference. Um, and so that's why it, what draws me back to the podcast, why I get excited, you know, to talk about things. And in some ways I think sometimes I think, well, I don't really feel that way anymore, or I don't really experience that anymore. And then I realized that it doesn't really matter because it's not about me, it's about you. And if I can impart some lessons, new or old, that are going to help you in your life, then that's what makes a difference. And, uh, you know, all that being said, I did experience some anxiety in the last 12 months um, uh, in, a, in a couple of more serious ways. Why don't I talk about that now? I was going to talk about that in a different episode, but I'll talk about that now. So I don't know what brought this on. Um, I think it might just be... Um, sort of accumulative, cumulative stress from the pandemic and life and uh, some job changes on my side and just all that stuff building up and and kind of working super hard to make things successful. But probably three times in the last year, I've had anxiety attack style situations where I've had to actually lay down on my bed and I've just had to sort of breathe through it where I've had chest pains and um, heart palpitations and like you know, for those of you who've had these like proper proper symptomatic stuff, where I've looked at my Apple Watch and I've done the I can't remember what the test is now. You can do on your Apple Watch to check your uh, uh, heart rate to make sure it's consistent. Uh, I can't remember the term, but you know what I mean. Uh, heart rate variability monitor or something. But I've checked that and thought, is there everything okay? You know, anxiety is that tricky tricky thing where it makes you wonder if you're dying or not sometimes, right? And uh, it turns out good old anxiety just still very effective at its job of making you freak out. And uh, that's what it did to me on those occasions where I had to lay down. And uh, yeah, just super... I mean, on one occasion, I remember actually just falling asleep with sort of mid-anxiety feelings of like super tight um, pain in my chest and uh, all of that stuff going on. Sorry about that background noise. Um, all of that stuff going on and then, um, yeah, and just having to sort of fall asleep and, and waking up the next day and thinking, oh, thank God it's gone. It's not here anymore. So I don't really know what the, I don't really, can't really pinpoint this. There wasn't a specific event which brought that on for me. It was more just, um, you know, cumulative things, I think, in my life that got me stressed out enough that my body was like, stop, you got to stop. <laughs> There's all this stuff going on. And you know, my belief with anxiety a lot of the time is that it's kind of uh, that that fire alarm going off that's a reminder of you that you need to change something. It's the, it's the you know, the tap on the shoulder to say, oi, slow down, mate, you're going to explode or something's going to happen. Like, it's just, you, you need to have more self-care. And one of the things that I'm terrible at is slowing down because it's just not in my makeup. I'm a competitive person. I like to go fast. I like to, you know get things done and get stuck in and and the the downside of the positive part of that is it you know you get stuff done 
the the negative side of that is is that sometimes you burn out and i've you know burnt out a number of times from just like even back in the day with the podcast i'd just be up at one in the morning thinking of new ideas and need to create another podcast need to put out more content must create an instagram post must create a facebook post should get back to people quicker um should do more coaching calls all these types of things so and then that just takes the you know the sentiment around helping people with anxiety isn't to make your own anxiety worse in in the process you know and that's why coming back to this again after some time off i'm kind of re-engaging it in a more gentle playful way it's not you know um it's not a uh, revenue stream for me that puts food on the table anymore i don't have to monetize it um or or make it sort of pay the bills i can do it in a more um gentle way and just you know, do the parts of it that I enjoy, frankly. I mean, what's wrong with saying that? There's, there's elements of it where you feel forced to create social media content or you feel forced to to do specific things which just feel a bit like a job and it feel a bit like an obligation. The only thing I think in, in podcasting land which does remain true um, as it relates to this is just consistency because people just get pissed off if you, like, put stuff out and then don't put stuff out for a while because it's like, hey... I was relying on you, man. I knew that if I turned my phone on on a Wednesday morning or a Tuesday morning, I was going to see your big face there, and now I don't see it. So get back. Um, anyway, that happened. I and mean, on one of those occasions, I went to the hospital. I did go to the hospital because I was like, this is weird. And it feels like nothing I've ever experienced before. And so even after 10 years of dealing with anxiety in, in greater or lesser extents, I had a panic attack which sent me into the old ER, and uh, and I became one of the statistics of people who go to the emergency room with a panic attack. And I just said, you know, I was I was wasn't doing anything weird either. It's not like I was sprinting up hills or like lifting pianos. I was just at home, sat around working or drinking tea or something where you would normally find me. And I just started having this horrific pain and had to lay down and tell my wife about it. And so it just I was like, in case anything happens, this is what's going on for me. And then I said, I think I'm just going to go to the hospital and get checked out so you know and i recommend this for for everybody who suffers to an extent which they're just uncomfortable with do go and get it checked out you need that peace of mind right now the danger becomes if you go and get it checked out all the time so the subsequent times i got the same symptoms i didn't go back again i just said right it's the same thing i just got like and i didn't really i don't really feel like at this point like i've solved it i just you know moved through it and carried on my life and was gentle on myself as much as possible and, and off you go. So went to the hospital, doctor said, um, yeah, I'm not sure what this is, but we're going to take a urine sample. We're going to take a blood test. Uh, did they take a blood mm. test? Yeah, I think so. A blood test. And we're going to put you on a, um, the heart rate variability thing, whatever that is, and check your heart rate so they can see if it's, you know, if your heart's beating consistently over time. So I had all those things done. They said, no, you're absolutely fine. Get out of here. It's just a panic attack or something. But we don't know what it is, but it's not that. You're not dying. It's not a heart attack. I suppose I was going in to rule out having a heart attack. It wasn't a heart attack. Um, but a lot of people feel like they're having a heart attack when it turns out to be anxiety. So anyway, that's a bit about that. Um, I feel like there's not really much more to say on that subject apart from, yeah, still got it. Still got it. <laughs> people say that when they like you know hit a great goal shot still got it well in my case anxiety still got it but um yeah it's you know just it's just something you gotta continue to it the thing it does make me do is it makes me reflect a bit on my life and see like where are the potential causes of said anxiety and in today's world we don't have to look very far it might be just sort of an overflow of uncertainty around life and travel and not seeing my family in england for a long time and worrying about my kids or worrying about getting the vid getting covid um uh, all those things might be just piling up over time right so anyway i wanted to share that because i think it's important that um you know even after all the stuff i've done and been through it's it's not i'm not immune to it it can come back and it's a good reminder that we need to take exceptionally good care of ourselves and and not be complacent around having beaten anxiety because i don't think it's something to beat i think it's something to um you know something to just move past move beyond and to to live your life in in the best possible way so i'm still still refining things and working on things but that's kind of a bit of an update there anyway today i wanted to talk about 
the anxiety of becoming a father. This is something um, which I have been thinking about for a long time, years, because my oldest son is now 15, so this, is, this isn't new for me. Um, and I don't know why I haven't, I just haven't. And every time I talk to my wife about it, she's like, why, why have you done that episode yet? People need to hear that. And I'm like, oh God, because it's just painful and personal and stuff. But that's what I'm going to talk about today, the anxiety about becoming a father. So this isn't so much like one of those episodes where I'm going to tell you a problem and then I'm going to tell you how to solve it. It's more just me relaying an experience because I want you to know that it's normal. And uh, probably one of the final catalysts for me to do this recently um, was I got an, an email from a listener saying, you know, thanks so much for your podcast. I really enjoy it. And by the way, I've recently been through this thing as a new dad, didn't know what to expect, wasn't sure what was going on and, and kind of this is what happened. So that's what I want to talk a little bit about. So I'll, I'll tell you the story. I'll tell you a few of the old bits and pieces within the story. And um, yeah, hopefully it provides some comfort or some level of... Uh, yeah, just the fact that you're not alone, essentially going through these types of things. And this might apply to, and I'm talking about it from a father's point of view, not the mother having the baby, but the father, you know, standing by the side and kind of watching that happen. Um, that doesn't mean this episode's explicitly relevant for men, because if you are a, a, a mother and you've had a child, then you, you have likely have a partner or a husband who's been through some of these things and likely have been through some of the, the emotions yourself. So anyway, there you go. So the birth of my first son um, was going fine, we thought, and uh, on one occasion, um, my wife started to feel a bit unwell, and we walked. We lived at the time close to her parents, so we walked down the road to her parents' house, and her mum has a blood pressure monitor uh, on hand, so she got the old Velcro out and wrapped that round her arm and fired it up, and it turned out she had high blood pressure. Now, at this point, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think she was about uh, six weeks before she was her due date so six weeks premature um anyway we phoned in to the hospital or the doctor or somebody and and they said yeah you should probably go to the hospital so we went to the hospital uh without a bag or any belongings or any intention of staying there just to kind of get checked out when we got to the hospital we sat and waited for a little bit and then spoke to a doctor and the doctor said yes this is a condition called preeclampsia and uh essentially it's it's not good for the health of your um, son, and we're gonna need to. Uh, you're gonna need to have the baby tonight. You're gonna have to have the baby right now. And we were like, "Oh my god, we're not psychologically ready for this because we thought we had six weeks. We thought we had lots of time, and we were prepping and painting mobiles, and I don't know what people do before their babies." Um, so they kind of put us in this communal birthing area where they where they put like a holding room until they're ready to to deal with you or, or put you in your own. Uh, ward or room or wherever they I think we had a I think for us first child we were had a semi private room which means we were sharing a room with one other person um you know you've made it when you have a private room in a hospital because then you can just have less noise than other people uh making noises but anyway I think we had a semi private room um and but in that holding area the one of the first things that freaked me out was they put us in there and just not being exposed to these types of things there was another lady there who was in labor and she was screaming like at the top of her lungs like chilling screams and uh we were sat there kind of behind you know they just pulled the curtains around on the little rails and they pulled the curtain around and the doctor obviously went in you could hear the doctor talking to her and he said oh you're only you know you're three centimeters dilated so my understanding is not being an expert on this stuff, but three centimeters dilated is pretty early stages because you need to be 10 centimeters dilated to actually give birth. So she was screaming like that and we were like, oh my God, she just started. This is going to get worse. So that was kind of part of the whole hospital experience. And, uh, you know, I understand hospitals are multifaceted places where they got to take care of lots of people and stay clean and be efficient and stuff. So I'm not blaming the hospital, but just the overall environment is, is horrific for your mental health. Um, the bright white lights, the, the noises, the beeps, um, the sick people that you see everywhere sort of, you know, walking around hooked up to, um, IVs and all that kind of stuff. It's just it's just a, an uncomfortable environment. And, you know, there's lots of people who don't like hospitals at all for good reason that you only go there when you are sick or you're visiting a sick relative or you've historically visited a sick relative. It has lots of sort of, uh, 
you know, it retains lots of that mental stuff in your mind, which is, which can create some, some, some form of PTSD, which is what I think I had some form of PTSD around the experience stuck with me after the fact. Um, and you know, I think the nutrition as well, like the hospital seemed to just give you like, uh, as the father of the, the mother, she got meals and stuff delivered. And that, there was a sort of area where you could go and make yourself a cup of tea or coffee and you could make like unlimited slices of toast with jam on it <laughs> and little pots of applesauce. And so that's what I was living on while we were in the hospital. But uh, that probably doesn't help, like not having good stuff. I think the overall, actually, the, the biggest part of being a father in a hospital when you're having a baby is the lack of sleep. And then moving into being a parent, the lack of sleep overall is just absolutely horrific on your mental health. So, you know, that's how they torture people is through lack of sleep and bright lights and loud noises. And you have, you know, the only other thing they're missing is throwing buckets of cold water over you. But there are lots of those components in a hospital, which is just going to make you the only the word that comes to mind is like jangly, like it just everything's like, you know, you're just on a hair trigger of everything that happens just freaks you out. So and the uncertainty of like, is the child going to be OK? Are they going to survive? Is your wife going to live like there's just lots of uh, worst case scenarios that you play through in your head. Right. And as we know, with anxiety, we're not supposed to do that, Tim. Don't do worst case scenarios because you're following the the anxiety beast down its tunnel. But you do that. It happens. And, and you know, um, so anyway, the other thing is the people. Some of them, you know, many of the nurses were fantastic. And I remember we one of the nurses we got, which is obviously specific to me, but one of the, if you ever hear me having a break, I'm just having a little sip of my drink so I can keep talking. <laughs> uh, one of the nurses we got was actually English, which I found massively comforting because having grown up in England and having an English mother, just that voice and nurturing and stuff, I was like, oh, this is felt very reassuring. We're in good hands. You can keep the baby. Just give him back when he's like big enough to not be fragile. That'd be really nice. Can you raise him till he's like four or something? Then I'd be happy. Um, so she was really nice, but this that was, you know, some nurses came in, they're having a bad day or whatever. And that really impacted us because you're kind of in a, a mode where you're, you, you know, they have a lot of power in the situation. They're telling you what you can and can't do. They're telling when you can go home and when you can eat and when you can sleep and when the baby can feed. And if it's not feeding and, and, I think I just asked Steph before I made this episode. I said, how long were we in the hospital for? Because it felt like six months. She said, no, it was about a week. I was like, oh, okay, God. <laughs> well, that's not an impressive amount of time to suffer. Well, I've just got to say it's more than a week. But no, I think it's about a week. Um, uh, the other thing is with the doctors, obviously the doctors are very busy on the, on the, uh, um, on the ward with all the children, blanking on the name of that now. Um, pediatrics, pediatrics maybe. Um, but in that area, the doctors are busy. They got to do the rounds. They go around and they check on all the people on the different shifts. And part, you know, part of the waiting, you're at the mercy of, you know, these godlike characters who have got to come in and tell you your destiny and, and tell you whether you're allowed to go home or you have to stay longer or if the baby's okay or if they got to do some other intervention. Um, one of the things I forgot, which I was just talking to Steph about, was um, when my oldest son was born. He, uh, he, because he was premature, he was a bit weak, uh, and, uh, he was having trouble feeding, having, having trouble nursing. And so they suggested we, he was tongue tied and we cut his tongue. Uh, the nurse had said that he would be, have likely have a speech impediment if we didn't cut his tongue. So a lot of these like big, you know, scary decisions have to be made when you've got no, you, you haven't got time to Google it or like ask a friend or phone your parents and say, should we cut his tongue or do this? you know, procedure they're considering it's like in the moment. Anyway, luckily we said no, and he doesn't have a speech impediment and everything's fine. But just those types of things in a hospital environment are like, that's stressful because you just don't know if are they, you know, is everything they say, you know, the total hundred percent gospel and you should just follow that. Or can you actually like make your own independent decisions around what you're going to do? So that was hard. And, uh, there's a few of those kind of through the process. Um, and, and so, yeah, just waiting for that doctor to come and, and, you know, you're constantly looking at the clock and, oh, they should, when does their shift start? They probably should have been now. They've been on the ward for like two hours. Why haven't they come to see us? Is something wrong? And we have to stay another day. And they weigh, because he was premature and underweight, they then weigh his poo and, and nappies, diapers to see how much they weigh. And then, cause you've, you, if you're sort of born and your weight's declining, 
I'm not an expert on this, obviously, so feel free to uh, uh, just disregard this part if I get it wrong. But my understanding is is that when you're born, if your weight is declining, you have to, it has to stabilize and start increasing a little bit before they let you go home in some cases. In our case, that's what happened. So his weight's declining after he's born. He's got to start drinking milk and feeding and stop pooping as much. And then once the weight stabilizes or starts to go up, then you can go home. Because then that means that the baby's thriving and everything's fine. Anyway, his weight's dropping. And they come in and weigh his nappies and weigh his poop and weigh him. Then they got the full picture and they're like, well, his weight hasn't gone up yet. And I was like, I'm going to I'm gonna pee in his diaper myself. I'm going to fill it up. He's put on a pound today, Mr. Collins. This is amazing. <laughs> you can definitely go home. Take your big baby home. But no, I didn't do that. I just had to wait. So we waited and eventually they let us go home. But yeah, that the other thing, which was just an absolute you know, mind bender was he's hooked up to an oxygen saturation machine, which goes on the end of your finger. It clips on the end of your finger. Baby's fingers are pretty small, if you didn't know. And so it fell off all the time. And uh, when it fell off, an alarm would go off on the little mechanical device next to his bed, which was just like, think of like the most horrific bedside alarms uh, to wake you up in the morning. And it's just like super loud. And so being very tired, drifting in and out of consciousness. The baby's finally asleep. Everything's fine. He's just had some food for the first time ever. He's drinking milk. This is amazing. He's drifted off and ah, 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 beeping in your ear. It's like, God alive. You jump up. Is the baby alive? Nurse comes in. Oh no, not to worry. Just his oxygen saturation monitor. Everything's fine. But that, that thing was faulty. Whoever makes that, make a better one. That's terrible, pathetic machine going off all the time. So anyway, I think, you know, these things were just, it's just a culmination of all this stuff that happens and like just does your head in after a while because it's like so much, uh, you know, just that accumulation of stress and and, you're, and at the same time, my wife's been, been stitched up after having the birth and so she's extremely groggy on um, some medication and... I had to like lift, physically lift her up and carry her to go to the toilet. And then she'd go to the toilet. There'd be blood everywhere. And so clean that up and put her back in bed again. And then the baby's thing's gone off. And it's just like, wow, this is stressful. Um, so anyway, lots of things there. The actual birth itself was pretty traumatic as well because, you know, he was just premature. And, and so when he came out, um, I remember at one point, um, going to the the sort of um where the the birth was happening down that end of the body because most of the time I was up near my wife's head sort of talking to her and consoling her and putting ice packs on the back of her neck but at one point I don't know what I went down the other end for but I did and I turned around and looked and I shouldn't have looked but I looked forever burned in my memory um but yeah when, once he came out they put him on a, a sort of tr um, a metal tray with a blanket on top and a little heating lamp and stuff and they d instantly Instead of what is often the way when they would lift the baby up and put it on the mother's chest so they can bond and connect. And there's, you know, there's other people who talk about the, the stress of the child and that initial interaction or the stress of their birth coming into the world and that initial interaction is then going to subsequently affect their personality and levels of anxiety. And I totally believe that. Like, it makes so much sense because it's, you know, it must be hard on their little uh, systems. But anyway, he came in. And uh, they put him on this thing and started weighing, me, weighing him and measuring him. And uh, yeah, he had to go off on this little heated device and, and was kind of taken away. So, you know, there's my wife on one side being put back together. And they said, right, dad, if you want to come with us, we're going to take the baby somewhere else. So then they take him into like the, um, I don't know, the NICU or whatever it's called, the neonatal intensive care unit. And they put him on a thing and put a lamp on him and wrap monitors around his little toes and they had to um tape a, a little cord onto his cheek which went up his nose and into his stomach to feed him because he couldn't feed himself well enough and so you know I, I, I don't know if i'm painting a pretty traumatic picture but that's what it felt like at the time and uh so yeah i'm telling you this whole story just because i know that if you're listening to this and you're recently been a father um then you've probably been through some of this yourself and uh, and and have experienced some of this trauma. I will say that my second child, who's who's definitely been challenging 
as he's uh, grown. But as a baby, he was very easy. We were in and out of the hospital in 24 hours. His birth was fine. It was effortless. It was natural. It was good. Just popped out and when we went home, you know, it was fine. Um, so they weren't all traumatic. My third one was then a bit more traumatic, uh, home birth. And then he wasn't getting enough oxygen and we had to end up going to the hospital and, uh, and then started to stay in there for a while. So he sort of thrived and took him home. So that wasn't good. But even with the one that wasn't traumatic, I was still on a total knife edge. Cause I was like, this is just, I was reliving you for each child. You're sort of reliving what happened the first time. And so, um, it's rough. It's rough. There's lots of, and I think that PTSD stuck with me for some time. Cause then even when you get home, you still, obviously in, with your first child, you're brand new to lots of things. We, uh, we bought this device called an angel care monitor, I think it was called, but it's essentially under the, under the baby's mattress in their crib. It's a, uh, it's a movement sensor and so the designed with the idea in mind that if the baby's breathing and moving a little bit then the sensor's fine but if uh the baby stops moving or breathing a little bit then the, the alarm goes off it's another alarm stop with all these alarms um interestingly with our second two children we didn't use them on it because it ended up just being more stressful than it was worth you know the alarm goes off you run in you like get your face real close to the baby's face and you're like is he breathing is he moving can you see his chest going up and down I don't know, poke him a little bit, see if he makes any noise. Oh, he's still breathing. Okay, he's still, he's fine. Now he's crying. You go pick him up, walk around with him. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I felt, I definitely felt like a bit spaced out for a while. And I think a lot of that was just good old sleep deprivation, just catching up with you and, and making you feel pretty crap um, and a bit sort of out of body type experience. And so this, this episode wasn't a, and isn't about necessarily teaching lessons as much as just share an experience so that you kind of know what we're going through or what I went through specifically and kind of what I had to deal with um and so that was you know that's kind of the story and and uh one of the things I did thereafter when my when my son wouldn't sleep very much is I ended up sleep training him which was uh which was kind of interesting but I read a couple of books and realized that his mum couldn't sleep train him because she saw him as a sort of food the old meal ticket. And so he didn't really want to sleep around her. So I'd spent a few nights, a couple of nights where I just sort of held him. And I did this, I think the method is called the pick up, put down method where the baby's crying in his, in his crib, you pick him up and hold him against your chest. You don't speak to him. You don't sing to him. No lullabies, no zhuzhing from side to side as though you're on a boat. You just stand still and you hold the baby. So the baby knows that you're there, but you don't, you don't come for them in any way. So I did that put him back in his crib you wait 10 minutes he'd probably start crying again you pick it up do it again i did that for a couple of days and uh it sleep trained him so i thought i was amazing after that i was very happy i was going to become a male doula no i wasn't but we got through that one um anyway that's kind of uh, a bit of the story about um the birthing experience um you know the only practical takeaways i think would be to prioritize sleep for yourself whenever you can like sleep 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 because sleep deprivation is a is horrific and uh if there's any chance where you can give your 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 wife a break or or her to give you a break you don't need to suffer together all the time you need to like you know just make sure you're getting some sleep if you've got friends and family nearby that's an absolute blessing take all the help you can get you don't need to do it on your own it takes a village it should take a village because it's bloody hard <sighs> and then if you have another chick kid then the first one wakes up the second one and then good luck <laughs> i did that we uh had our second child probably 18 months after the first one good times good times but you know now interestingly my uh the son that some of this story is about is uh 15 years old he's uh ironically after being premature he's now six foot one or something like that he's a big boy he's massive and my youngest brother alex who was also six weeks premature or potentially more born in february in uh in england but he is he turned out to be like six foot six he's you know he came out as a very small child very fragile and now he's he's an absolute beast so you know the, those things that happen in the past don't necessarily represent uh, what what's going to happen in the future, but uh, that's it. So I've, I've wanted to tell that story for a long time, and um, again, it's not really many lessons in there. But I just wanted to share it because if you're going through this 
and you, you it caused some anxiety for you or some or some PTSD and obviously there is uh, postpartum depression and and all sorts of other stuff which plays into this possibly but in terms of that trauma for me I just wanted to share that story and kind of what happens so that it may um, resonate with you or, or give you some comfort that you're not alone and uh, for me you know coming out of that was really about prioritizing sleep and where I could sort of taking care of my own well-being and uh and realizing that you know the baby's going to be fine babies are pretty resilient and uh you don't need to be there all the time actually the only other thing i didn't talk about was the other thing which sort of freaked me out a bit about having a child was just the the fragility of them they're fragile and so you know i just didn't feel super comfortable picking him up for a while because he's so small and little and and you know that it's just such a such a lot of uh responsibility i think the responsibility of having a child and they're so small and weak and and you've you've now got to take care of them you've gone from only being responsible for yourself and you know keeping your significant other happy and and uh and maintaining that relationship to now having another person you got to take care of who can't take care of themselves like that the the sheer weight of that alone is significant so not to be underestimated but anyway there you go if you've enjoyed this episode please um tell a friend tell somebody you love get them listening to the anxiety podcast as well leave a review wherever you can send me a message with stuff you want me to talk about and remember until next time less anxiety more life thank you for listening to the anxiety podcast for more information go to the anxietypodcast.com